Dr. Prasad. Dr. Prasad uh, uh, from India, I think from the All India Society is joining us. Good afternoon, everyone. After Professor Ismail, noon, Dr. Rahman. Hello, Nihal. Ahil Dr. Rahman. I think Dr. Prasad, uh, Dr. Nihal uh, should start. And uh, we would like to welcome Dr. Prasad from the All India Society. Can we start, Dr. Prasad? Hello. Hi. Good evening. Good, Good evening. evening, sir. Good evening. How are you? All on behalf of the, uh, nice to on see behalf you of the Egyptian. Yes, yeah, thank yeah, you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. On behalf of the Egyptian Society of Ophthalmology of, of, yeah. of Egypt, yeah. We thank you for uh, hosting with us uh, this meeting, and we are delighted to be with you and looking forward to uh, to see you in Cairo. We, we will be holding the, the Egyptian Society annual meeting in May, 17th of May. Okay. And uh, we, we have uh, firmed, uh, we have signed uh, a, an agreement with the All India Society to have a mutual uh, uh, interchange with uh, all our colleagues in India. Okay, that's very nice. Good. Good to know that, yeah. Definitely, we'll be really happy to be uh, associated with the uh, Egyptian Ophthalmological Society and uh, uh, have many friends over there and uh, have been in traction with them for the long time. And uh, Dr. Hosham, Dr. Ashraf, and all, all they are very good friends. So we have of been course. having association with them a lot. So with you also, like, uh, it's very nice meeting you and uh, all of you here. Good evening. and. Uh, and uh, we can, I think, uh, uh, have a very nice association because uh, I'm looking after, because I would like to, to be associated with you uh, from the Delhi Ophthalmological Society also, because I'm the president now at present in Delhi Ophthalmological Society. And uh, mm -hmm. definitely we'll That's be associating with you. And we do have a very conference here in Delhi. So we'll be associated with you in the future, definitely. Please email me or send me on WhatsApp. My email and WhatsApp is with uh, Dr. Uh, Namrata. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Namrata or Dr. Uh, uh, Kripal. I think his name was, uh, who, uh, he is the actual president, I think. And uh, please send me on WhatsApp to have your phone number and I will, we will yeah. be in contact together and we yeah. will arrange something with Delhi, of course, Delhi. Definitely, uh, definitely. Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. definitely. So I think uh, most of uh, our moderators have not yeah. been there. I think moderators have not. Um, Dr. Uh, Nihal is ready, I think. Dr. Nihal is shakun khair. Dr. Nihal Hassan, uh, do you like to say something, Dr. Nihal Adil Hassan? Uh, it's to my pleasure to uh, be in that uh, meeting and to be a moderator. And uh, it's a very nice meeting. Uh, uh, we'll uh, present, uh, we'll, uh, and we'll start uh, not to waste our time. Yeah. I, uh, Professor Nihal Shakankiri, ready? She will start. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, Professor Nihal Shakankiri, uh, she's uh, uh, one of the best uh, pediatric surgeons uh, in Egypt, and uh, she's the founder of uh, Pediatric uh, Ophthalmology uh, uh, Center in Alexandria University. And uh, uh, she was the named one of the best 100 uh, Egyptian women uh, last year from uh, President, uh, uh, our President Sisi. Uh, and uh, she always uh, uh, 
I, uh, we are pleased always to hear from her uh, the nice lectures. She will present a microspherophilia in a pediatric uh, uh, surgeries, uh, emergencies in children. Uh, okay. Um, I would like to thank you for a kind invitation for me to participate in your meeting. And I'm going to present microspherophakia as a pediatric ocular emergency. Microspherophakia is a small spherical lens. It is variable in size. It may be small, it may be large, and variable in the degree of sphericity. It may be a total sphere, or maybe sometimes a sphere from the center and uh, it is flat from the periphery. Uh, the zonules may be totally intact or may be elongated or may be disrupted. Uh, clinical presentation, the child usually presents with tremulous iris, shallow anterior chamber due to the increase in anteroposterior diameter of the lens, as you see here with the UBM, the large anteroposterior diameter in relation to a very shallow anterior chamber. And the red reflex in these infants Usually it is bright in the center and at the periphery here at the edge of the pupil, it is dark or it presents with a glistening edge at the side here of the pupil. And this glistening edge may extend 360 degrees and you should uh, differentiate between the microspherophakia and the congenital cataract, the lamellar opacity, which does not shine, the edge is not shining. Here again, this is a microspherophakia and this is a congenital cataract. And sometimes you see it bright against red reflex, the shining edge of the microspherophakia. Uh, the pupil may be dilatable and you can see the lens perfectly. And sometimes the pupil doesn't dilate. Can you see here, there is fibrosis at the edge of the pupil. Here, this is again fibrosis that prevent good dilatation of the pupil and it can be misdiagnosed. Here again, this is fibrosis of the pupil. It may be associated with megalocornea and the corneal circumference may be circular or maybe elliptical. It may present with a very high myopia, the child coming with a very high myopia. And in these children, look at the edge of the pupil, you can see the edge of the microspherophakic lens. And here presenting with a high myopia, if you look here against red reflex, you can see the microspherophakia. And some children may present when the lens subluxate, they may present with a very high astigmatism and sometimes a very high myopia and very high astigmatism, which is lenticular origin, may be associated with systemic anomalies as vile Marchesani syndrome with short square hand or square feet, may be associated with homocystinuria with morphinoid features. And why it is considered as an ocular emergency? Because it may dislocate easily into the anterior chamber, causing damage to the back surface of the cornea. It may dislocate and become adherent to the back surface of the cornea like that and become cataractus. And here a child with dislocated microspherophakia, his father is totally blind from the same condition or may dislocate into the posterior segment as you see here in this child in the left eye, it is dislocated into the anterior chamber. And the very next day, it dislocates into the posterior uh, segment in and out until it's settled down into the, into the anterior, the, the back surface, um, into the posterior segment. And you can see here pigmentation denoting Sheffer sign due to a giant retinal tear and start of PVR. It may present with all types of secondary glaucoma. That's why it is considered as an ocular emergency. When it subluxate, it may present with a secondary angle closure glaucoma with iridocorneal contact. And here, severe and long-standing iridocorneal contact due to subluxated microspherophakia. It may cause papillary block glaucoma and become cataractus and may dislocate into the anterior chamber here, causing again glaucoma with severe corneal edema sometimes. 
It may present with a long-standing papillary blood glaucoma associated with iris atrophy and a very long-standing papillary blood glaucoma associated with ciliary staphyloma. And here the mother is totally blind from the same condition. This is the microspherophakia and here is ciliary staphyloma. It may be associated with um, AC dysgenesis as Peter um, uh, as Rager, Axenfield anomaly here associated with microspherophakia. And apart from the glaucoma that is associated with AC dysgenesis, it may cause papillary block glaucoma or may present since birth. Why? Due to uh, corneal lenticular adhesion. And here after lensectomy, the child year before and few months after surgery, one, the, in one eye, the pressure was controlled and in the other eye, it needed trabeculectomy. It may also present with iris anomalies as for example, iris coloboma with or without corneal touch or glaucoma that is caused by congenital aniridia with or without iridu lenticular adhesion or may present with total blindness, shallow anterior chamber, lost anterior chamber, a large corneal diameter and corneal lenticular adhesion. Sometimes it is misdiagnosed as a primary congenital glaucoma, as in this child. She had two glaucoma surgeries, but what you see, the, the, the etiology is a microspherophakia. Why it is misdiagnosed? Because the pupil is undilatable. So in any case of congenital glaucoma, you have to go for a UBM to exclude the presence of microspherophakia. And here, uh, a refractory a glaucoma, and the etiology, again, here is a microspherophakia. So management. In these cases, once diagnosed, you have to go for lensectomy. We go for lensectomy through two corneal wounds, and then we make the anterior capsule rexis, and then hydrodissection, hydrodelineation, irrigation, aspiration, and then the capsular bag has to be eaten totally, anterior of vitrectomy, and here at conclusion of surgery. Even if you have sometimes difficulties in surgery, for example, in performing the anterior capsular axis, you may penetrate the lens with the MVR and then complete the rexis in the conventional way. And sometimes you make what is called Ufferth anterior capsular axis. How to perform it in a very shallow anterior chamber? We hold the anterior capsule and we push forward and then we push towards the wound, you're going to have a, a beautiful anterior capsular axis or half offered capsular axis, push forward, push forward and then complete in the conventional way and then complete the surgery, irrigation aspiration and the capsular bag eaten up and here at conclusion of surgery. In some cases that you have a very small microspherophakia, you can hold the lens with a special forceps and then you do the rexes while holding the lens. Now you have a beautiful small rexes, hydrodissection, hydrodelineation, irrigation aspiration, and then the small capsular bag is eaten up with a cutter and here, at conclusion of surgery, you close these tiny wounds through, uh, you go for surgery through anterior approach. What if you have the lens subluxated? You can hold the lens from the start, initiate the tear and keep on holding the lens while performing the anterior capsular axis. And you can even use a hook to centralize the lens and then perform the hydrodissection, hydrodelineation, irrigation, aspiration. Look here after. Irrigation aspiration, look, the zonules are disrupted, but no vitreous did prolapse. So there is no fluctuation of the anterior chamber. And this denotes that you did a very simple surgery without disrupting the anterior vitreous space, lowering the incidence of retinal detachment in the future, and then complete the surgery. It has a beautiful advantage. If you have here, can you see keratola? This is iridal lenticular adhesion and total disruption of the zonules, when you go for the same thing here, hooking of the lens, can you see this cave? You can inject here hydrodissection. So it's a perfect hydrodissection and you can do, go for a very easy irrigation aspiration and eating up the bag. And even you can make a viscodissection at the end of surgery to these adhesions. 
This is unlike the microfacia with congenital cataract. You can leave a capsular support in the future here. Can you see this is the edge of the lens and these are the zonules for secondary IOL implantation here with magnification, the edge of the lens, the edge of the uh, summary ring and the zonules. And even in these microfacia, you can go for IOL implantation between the two rexes. But this is not applicable in the cases of microspherophagia. Don't be tempted by a large, beautiful capsular bag to leave like that a capsular support. What's going to happen? A few months after surgery, you will see this total collapse of the capsular bag because the zonules are extremely weak. They cannot withstand the capsular, the fibrosis of the capsular bag. This is another case that you have to go again for surgery to clear the visual axis. After surgery, we have immediately a deep anterior chamber. We fit the babies with aphecic spectacles, ultra thin high definition or multifocal aphecic spectacles in older children. And sometimes in some cases when you don't have glaucoma, for example, here a dislocated and a subluxated microspherophacia, you can go for secondary iris claw lens implantation in the future and ensure a very good uh, grip. This is five years after surgery and 10 years after surgery. This is with secondary glaucoma, papillary block glaucoma, here before at conclusion of surgery, immediately after surgery, before and after surgery, the pressure was controlled in one eye and the other eye was preserved. Here, you have to go for examination of the siblings. We did a surgery for her brother. A few months after surgery, his mm -hmm. glaucoma free. So finally, to conclude, microspherophagia may present with myopia, high astigmatism, but the most common complication are anterior and posterior dislocation with all types of glaucomas, congenital and acquired. So it is considered as a pediatric ocular emergency. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Excellent, uh, Dr. Anihal, as usual. Uh, can I ask a question, uh, Dr. Anihal, please? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, actually, the capsulotomy or the uh, offers capsulotomy that you have done is, is, is fantastic, really. I, I, I never saw it before with this. And it looks, is it easy as, as, yes. you, as you have seen it, as, yes. as I yes. have seen it? Because yes, it is. You have it's done it in one second. Like, mm. Yes, it, it, if you follow the rules, uh, it's going to be a very simple surgery. And usually the surgery for microspherophagia, whatever the type, whatever it is, subluxated or not, small or large, it just takes five minutes. Mm. It's, it's a five-minute surgery. Really... And it's much more easy than going through the pars placata or pars plana approach. Yes, and uh, we, you have the, the, the possibility of following particles of the nucleus, so... Yes. Doing it through the capsular bag and cleaning the gaps. Approach rather yes. than going past the planner. Yes. The excellent uh, presentation, Dr. Nihal. Actually, uh, I've seen very you. beautiful videos actually you have shown and uh, very nicely managed all these cases with the anterior root. And uh, some of these cases, like when, when you uh, take up for the secondary IL implantation in these cases, what is the exact age you take up? And what do you do in between, actually? Well, actually, not before the age of four years, this is to start with. And in cases of microspherophagia, I have to be 100% sure that they will not go into glaucoma. So if, if they're a sibling with a secondary glaucoma, I don't implant the whole family. Uh, the second thing... Uh, they don't present with, they should not present with glaucoma. And I follow up at least for a year to confirm that there is no possibility of developing secondary glaucoma. I go for secondary iris claw lens. I have the facility now of ultra thin high definition glasses. They are so beautiful. And now recently they are, uh, the, you can do for multifocal glasses. <laughs> So the glasses now are beautiful uh, option for fitting these uh, children by the modification in the in the manufacture of the and the quality of uh, the eyeglasses. I don't have the option in our country of fitting the babies with contact lens. It's not an option in Egypt. Yeah. 
Yeah. Why, why, Dr. Nihal? We don't have this option. Why we don't have this option? That's a good uh, question. The weather, the humidity, the, the, the cleanliness, uh, the care of the contact lens, and of course, uh, the, the financial part because you, you, the child may lose it easily so you're going to have buy another one so uh, I, I have infections I used to put to, to fit the babies with uh, contact lenses yeah, there is always the uh, corneal abrasions and abscess and so I don't think it's a wise decision in our country not a good decision Dr. Anihal Adel uh, something you would like to comment or to add? Uh, uh, yes, I would. Uh, I would like uh, to conclude from uh, Professor Shakankiri that uh, when uh, there is a suspicion for a secondary glaucoma in pediatric age group, uh, immediately to go for UBM to uh, delineate if uh, the cause is microphagia, because I think this will be an uh, ocular emergency in the pediatric age group for its uh, dislocation. Go for urgent surgery. Uh, for uh, any uh, other competition, right? I agree with you. That's very logic. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's uh, go for our second uh, presentation. Uh, Doctor, Doctor Mahmoud, should I, you can. Should I start? Okay. Hope you my uh, my presentation is shared now in the screen. Can you see it? Uh, Hal? Yeah, we can see the presentation. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Prasad. Yeah. Uh, I will. I would like to in uh, what kind of emergency for corneal uh, complications. Uh, we think that we have to have the philosophy of saving procedure, eye saving procedure, severe ectatic condition or uncontrolled corneal subsequence of. Medicine. Sometimes in the verses of the Quran, you are obliged to fight, uh, which is something that you don't like. Uh, some of the un uncontrolled infection, at the beginning, you are trying to give uh, a chance for the medical, topical, and systemic uh, medication. And uh, you are hoping that this can subside and uh, you can uh, go out with the case uh, winning. But unfortunately, Sometimes not. You come. You have a patient like this in the outpatient clinic coming to, to see you, and he says something is went out of my eye, and this is how it looks in the in the. And you are sitting in your clinic in the center of Cairo, and you don't know what to do. And this is another case. Somebody have uh, giving this patient a chance with amniotic membrane, and still uh, is is it's not working. So um, some cases are simple, like in lack of salmos, there's a tiny perforation. Either you try with contact lens, if it fails, you go for tectonic graft and simple fashion graft, you fashion a small graft, because normally the rest of the cornea is healthy and you can fashion a small graft like this. And you have it uh, uh, after treating the cause, of course, of the lack of salmos itself. And uh, you suture it, and normally the, it went okay if you treat the, the, the primary cause. And some patients are lucky that, like this patient, uh, you find a small graft of a previous keratoconus patient. And surprisingly, this patient is seeing 0.3, and actually we didn't do anything else for her. But not all cases are simple in rheumatoid patients. The melting is very severe and you have to go for a more extensive surgery. Like in this case, we found that the lens itself is not there. So uh, vitreous is coming out through this small, tiny perforated uh, melted cornea. And you have to aggressively clean up uh, everything and then uh, suture a graft fashion and suture a graft 
but you have to clean all the edges you in the, the media. Right yeah, and this is how we fashion the graft. And at the end, the patient is uh, getting uh, well. In a case like this, this is a disaster. A patient had bilateral ICL, which is completely against the law here in Egypt. Uh, she, the, she's, she's having a low hygiene and low socioeconomic standard and used to be contact lens wearer before. Uh, her surgeon uh, applied to her steroids as usual from day one, but he didn't notice that there is some kind of uh, tiny infection. And he, when she called him by uh, second day, he gave her more steroids even, and he, he said that this is just uh, a reaction. I don't think it looks like a cash. And the patient came with left eye melted. And you have to go for therapeutic graft. And a case like this, you have to remove all the cornea and pray that it will escape from uh, endothermitis. Uh, in a case like this, the patient uh, had a golden heart syndrome, a pediatric patient. And for some reason, the lens is opened. I don't know how it comes. It seems that the, her doctor tried to do her iridectomy. And uh, he touched the lens, and uh, we found lens particle in the anterior chamber. So I had to go for everything. Uh, this is how it looks, the, the dermoid from inside. And then I removed all the lens particle and cleaned the lens. And I kept the posterior capsule intact. Uh, and this is a, a, a part of a tectonic graft from taken from an eye from the patient of uh, that just performed uh, keratoplasty, and we finish fashioned uh, this uh, uh, tectonic graft just to save the eye because the pressure went up. And uh, the approach was very difficult having this dermoid cyst. Uh, in front of you. So you go for suturing. Part of the graft is in the sclera, of course, and part in the cornea. And this is how it looks at the end of the surgery. Surprisingly, after a few months, the patient developed clear cornea. And as, as you notice, the limbus only was uh, opacified. And I didn't have to do her a complete keratoplasty just uh, Look and, uh, capsulotomy uh, and, uh, and lens uh, implantation. And the patient went well with this. This is another kind of emergency, severe anterior staphyloma. You don't have a catalog for a patient like this or a user manual, how the steps, there is no steps for this kind of uh, operation. You go with surgery, it's a manual. You freehand hmm? uh, keratoplasty, uh, you, you go for just removing all the ecstatic part of the cornea. Heavily vascularized, of course. Prefer anterior synechia, all with blood. You apply the simple maneuver of 0.01 uh, epinephrine, and then you go for lens removal because there is anterior capsular cataract. And um, I don't think, I don't, I don't want even to go in for this patient again. Remove all synechia as much as you can. Apply the intraocular lens. Suture the iris in order to not to have uh, pupilloplasty, in order not to have uh, again uh, prefer anterior synechia. Manipulate the eye oil inside. Centralize as much as you can. As you can see, as much as you uh, you are centralizing the IOL, sometimes it gets out. 
but at least you are trying again and again until you have the IOL well centered and then suture the graft. These kind of surgeries, uh, rewarding in spite that you don't have a special step-by-step -step, uh, patient. And this is how it looked in the inside the bag. Uh, thank you very much for uh, hosting uh, the Egyptian Society of Ophthalmology in your uh, schedule. And once again, we, saw, we thank the All India and we are looking forward to make mutual uh, collaboration and scientific agreement. Thank you very much. Thank you, I Professor Smart. Uh, and, and now we'll uh, introduce uh, uh, Professor Ahmad Mustafa uh, uh, for uh, his uh, presentation of uh, emergency in cataract surgeries and complications. Okay, good afternoon. And thank you very much for my, uh, my invitation for such meeting. And we'll discuss today the emergency in cataract surgery. Okay, in uh, Mayo Clinic 2020, they uh, mentioned some of uh, Ukraine emergency. Uh, for example, orbits or lights, uh, end of salmice, acute angiological glaucoma, optic neurites. Giant cell arthritis, central retinal artery occlusion, retinal, detach retinal detachment, and the monomous hemianopia, and they didn't mention anything about cataract. But in cataract, in uh, reality, we can got emergency situation either preoperative or intraoperative or postoperative. Preoperative, may can discuss lens induced glaucoma, either phacomorphic or phacolytic or phacoantigenic or lens particle following cataract surgery. Preoperative also in cases of primary angle closure glaucoma, they found that you can treat with laser peripheral aerodectomy or our subscalar trabeculectomy, but even they discussed if you will do clear uh, lens extraction, this will control IOP. Preoperative lens subluxation and dislocation, and we can have many types of uh, lens subluxation or dislocation. Uh, in cases of subluxation, you can consider zonulysis, uh, either one quadrant or two quadrant or three quadrant. In case of one quadrant, you, are, you have stable lens capsule, you can do fake subluxation with capsule tension ring and IRL in the back. In cases of two or uh, three quadrants, this will be unstable lens capsule. So you can uh, shift to small incision cataract surgery and remove only the nucleus, and then you can use capsule tension ring and IOL in the back. If more than two quadrants, you can shift to ICC, intracapsular cataract extraction, and you can use scalar fixation or iris IOL fixation. Cases of traumatic cataract with open lens capsule can also, this will lead to uh, lens, lens cortical, cortical material in the anterior chamber with second glaucoma and also small lens with shallow or lost anterior chamber. Microscalophagia and uh, Professor Nahal Shkakiri also discussed this in details and also this uh, cataract emergency. In cases of intraoperative, Cataract surgery in emergency, we can have the posterior capsule capsular rupture, and this we can go to this science for posterior capsular rupture, either sudden deepening of the anterior chamber, peripheral snap sign, increased red glow, decreased flowability, and the nuclear tilt. In case of uh, posterior capsular rupture, we can uh, either we have uh, just the nucleus or uh, three quadrant or piece of the nucleus. If the complete the dislocation of the nucleus, so this will have to do anterior vitrectomy and then sulcus implantation of IOL. In other cases, and just a, a fragment or a, a large part of the nucleus, you can convert to manual 
uh, smaller incision cataract surgery or extra capsule technique, and then anterior vitrectomy and sulcus implantation. Interoperative, we can uh, face with supracroidal hemorrhage and we'll find thus lost red reflex, increased IOB, expulsion of ocular contents, and progressive shallowing of the anterior chamber. If you want to manage such case, interoperative reformer and uh, anterior chamber and rapid wound closure, and don't do any extra maneuvers. Postoperative control IOP, control ocular inflammation, control pain, and perform P B scan. I went to reoperate if there is no improvement or resistant high IOP, severe pain, or kissing choroidal detachment. Postoperative, you can got cataract emergency in case in shallow AC will be will be have got a leaky tunnel, malignant glaucoma, or supracoroidal effusion. To manage either medical cycloplegic with topical anti-glaucoma, intravenous manitol, or surgical uh, YAG hyaluronidotomy or posterior sclerotomy. Dislocated IOL. After cataract surgery, we can dislocate the bag IOL complex. We can use either fixation bag IOL complex with Hoffman technique or iris suture, or removal of the bag IOL complex completely. You can use iris glue IOL implantation or three-piece IOL implantation, either with clear fixation or a man technique. Cases of post over the end of thalmides. The golden standard is early within hours after communication, three port parts of vitrectomy by vitrectomy, vitrectomy surgery. You can have the, the, the diagnosis, be scan, urgent empirical intravitreal injection of antibiotics covering gram post of gram negative and then rope with vitreous and the echo step. Start medical regimen for endothalmites, including systemic and topical steroid, and repeat intravitreal or early vitrectomy. Endothalmites, indication of early vitrectomy if you have absence of red reflex and the poor presentation of uh, presentation of the vision on endothalmites, so have to operate early. This was in short how to be cataract surgery to be an emergency. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Dr. Ahmed, uh, for your uh, uh, very brief summarized uh, ocular emergencies in cataract uh, surgeries. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, I think it, this is I a think very comprehensive, uh, uh, very comprehensive review, uh, Dr. Yes. Ahmed. And Uh, the, the, your presentation, Dr. Mohammed Ismail. Yes. Like, you hear me? Huh? Your presentation was excellent. Uh, with, uh, Thank you, sir. And I just have some queries. Like uh, one of the cases you showed uh, post ICL, the corneal yes. infectious keratitis. So yes. uh, you have shown in both the eyes. So what is the trend in Egypt? Like you go ahead with the uh, ICL implantation in both the eyes at the same sitting or one eye at a time? This is against totally against the law, and this doctor uh, in, in, was uh, referred to the disciplinary uh, uh, committee of the, uh, the local syndicate, and okay. uh, he was he was condemned for his action. Okay, okay. So because it's very, think... very yeah unusual to have uh, both eyes and getting infected at the same time is uh, is, is something which is yeah, very unfortunate to have that kind of situation yeah. What, what kind of uh, regulation you have in India? Is it admitted admittable? Because in the United States they accept in some cases to do bilateral cataract the same sitting. Yeah. Is yeah. it acceptable in India no, or is... <laughs> in India it's not accepted in India by and large like. Um, uh, you can put it 99.9% .9 of the people, we do one eye at a time, even the ICL one eye at a time. Yeah, except the LASIK, LASIK we do both eyes together, but rest of the surgeries like ICL or cataract, uh, all, all these surgeries one, one eye at a time only. What an, because it's very strange that in, even in the United States, some, some 
you know that in the United States, some states have their own regulation. Other states, they contradict yeah, yeah, such yeah. regulation. Yeah. But yeah, what, yeah, so like there are some proposition, like some people propose bilateral surgery because there are some people, those who talk about the bilateral cathode surgery and bilateral ICL surgery, but we have always been opposing it. Because you see, you never know the infection coming in the eye, you never know. You do all your best and okay. even then that infection can take place. And it and if it happens in both the eyes together, then it's a crime. Total. It's a disaster. Yeah. Disaster. It's a disaster. Yeah. I'll tell you something. The other eye was saved, but yeah. saved was leukoma. Yeah. And we had to do cataract surgery and remove. So the patient is pseudophagic with leukoma in the right eye yeah. with the graft and aphecic in the left eye. Yeah, yeah, in the yeah. left eye, she's seeing 0.1 maximum and we nobody dares to do go inside again and do her another graft because she's not 100% clear graft, but she's, she's functioning. Yeah. And the right yeah. eye, she's seeing 0.4 maximum after mm -hmm. doing, yeah. And she used to have 20-20 vision with contact lenses. So okay. it is her her life have changed 180 degrees. That's true. Yeah, and that's true. This is a, a young lady, and um, yeah. it was the whole life very yes, bad. It's And how about uh, 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 intravitreal injection, Doctor Prasad? Do, do you have the same philosophy not to inject yeah. both eyes yeah. with the same one eye at a time? What eye at a time? Do you imagine that? Do you imagine that I visited one Egyptian doctor who works in the states? And he's there for about 20, 25 years, and he's now functioning. Yeah, and he, uh, he's a, a superhero there in, in Florida. You know that in Florida, everybody's a superhero doing cataract because it's a retirement <laughs> state right. for every American. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, you imagine a lot of the population of cataracts there is very high because yeah. of retirement. Okay. There. Okay. <laughs> so uh, he's a superhero there. So okay. I I always yeah I always joke, joke with him about this, and mm -hmm. he is uh, he injects intravitreal in the clinic, in the same chair of the examination uh, <laughs> slit lamp unit. You imagine intravitreal injection of um, of okay. Uh, okay. yeah intravitreal antivision. Anti yeah, it's it's, he, it's he, amazing. He's in the clinic, no? that is <laughs> that is it's not possible to do. <laughs> no. Not accepted because there are uh, various reports which have come up here in India post uh, intravitreal anti VEGF injection in ophthalmitis, and uh, uh, recently in a very uh, renowned institute of India, mm -hmm. PGM, very renowned institute. There they had almost twenty five to thirty cases. At the same day, endophthalmitis. It's uh, a break, yeah. This post intravitreal injection only. Yeah, outbreak, and, uh, outbreak. And the, later on, the infection was found in the, the, the bottle itself. Yes. Yeah, the bottle itself had the infection. So, yeah. so these the things doctors. can happen, you see, because it's very, we have to take care of all these things. It's important. Imagine that he is in, in, injecting in the clinic, it's, yeah, it's yeah. out of. Out of discussion in my country, it's impossible yeah, to do this. True, definitely not. Even even in our country, also like it's not accepted at all. <laughs> not accepted at all. Yeah. 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 Doctor do you like to have any comment, Nihal Hassan? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, 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 yani the medical legal part uh, should be uh, very well uh, announced between uh, doctors, especially in our countries. Uh, to avoid all emergency complications that we are faced with, especially the corneal complications of contact lens wearers uh, and the infections, so this should be condemned uh, because uh, I think uh, uh, there is a negligence in both for the patient, uh, from the patient side and from uh, the physician's side. Yes. Uh, uh, We'll, uh, we'll go for our further uh, presentations. Uh, doctor, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Uh, Ahmed Ghanim and Dr. Uh, Sadiq, they had a uh, social uh, emergency. Uh, Dr. Ghanim had her, his daughter uh, uh, graduation day has changed. And uh, I think we have an, uh, an Indian colleague who will be presenting something, uh, Dr. Prasad. Yeah, I don't see him here because he's not there in the 
picture here. I don't know because uh, I don't see him. Dr. Bupesh, uh, are you there? No. no, he's not there. He's not there. He's not Unfortunately, there. we have two of our uh, colleagues have called me a few, uh, just a few few uh, hours ago that they wouldn't be unfortunately had dr study has his car crashed in the way from going okay. back to the <laughs> he's with the mechanic now lifting <laughs> the car in one of the growers right, yeah, right. and uh, and uh, i think dr namrata is with her yeah dr namrata is there now you can see her. hi namrata how are you how are you i'm good Long time non seen. Yeah. <laughs> We've been crossing emails and. Yeah. So, Dr. Namta is busy because there are many episodes are going on. So, we already had uh, three presentations yes. are over. Yes. Sir. I think uh, now. Uh, because, uh, hello, next, hello, hello, Professor Namrata. Hello, hello, hello. How Nana. are you? I am fine. <laughs> fine. It's nice to see you. Same as. Yes. <laughs> we would like to have our ag agreement uh, fulfilled yes. this uh, this year, Dr. Namrata. Sure, and, sure. Uh, yeah. uh, shortly, we will send you the five uh, names of our uh, Egyptian uh, doctors who will be flying to uh, to the All India this year in May. And okay. uh, following, please send me the the five names of your uh, of our colleague, Indian colleagues that would love. To have them and uh, just one re remark if you don't mind uh, we would like uh, to be diffused in the program not a special session yes okay. because we would we would like to have you in our inside our program diffused in several in several presentations okay uh, as uh, whatever you would prefer of course okay okay Right. Uh, you have my my uh, my personal yeah, I have, phone number, I have. and uh, yeah. please anything. I, in, in few days, I will send you the names of the five doctors. Okay. Will be, uh, uh, is it a small city, Kochi, or do you call it Kochi, or what do you call it? It's Kochi. No, no, no. It's not a small city. It's, it's a very big city. big city. It is a big city. A big city. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a very very beautiful and, and one it of the has best a lot of in tourist in attractions, really? with backwaters, yeah. and yeah. It is beautiful. Ah, so, Nihal yeah. Adil Hassan will go for shopping there. She likes shopping. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love I love <laughs> India. And, yeah. and, and uh, Dr. Namrata know how much I love India. Yeah. So I whatever it's a small city, it is a big city. I'm yes. inshallah I'm coming. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a big city. <laughs> now, don't don't tell Professor Ismail so uh, because his he will be here in Egypt to arrange for our mm -hmm. meeting. Oh, yeah, we, are, we are leaving the president have... for the most <laughs> <laughs> for the work to be done. Yeah. Uh, if Dr. Prasad would like to join, it would be very, uh, yeah, yani, very, very, like very beautiful, it. and uh, we would love to have you with Dr. Namrata. Yeah. Of course, yeah. whatever the five colleagues you elect, it's yeah. they are most welcome. Okay. Actually, uh, Dr. Ismail, I... because I was uh, I I was there in Libya for some time. Really, so, you work there. Yeah, so I have a lot of friends uh, in Egypt. Actually, a lot of friends. Well, yeah, but what? That's that's so very you are nice. You're most that's welcome well. to join, sir. Then. Yeah. So yeah. I know your language also very well. Yeah, really. You you you, 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 you could treat well with them. I yeah. speak also. I speak. Uh, ah, we language. have with us uh, president of All India Ophthalmological Society, also Egyptian Medical ah. Society. Yeah. How are you, sir? And so it's nice to, to all of you. you. Hi, Dr. Lali. Exactly. How are you? Hi. Good evening. Thank you very much. Good evening. Very nice to see all our Egyptian colleagues. And uh, hello, hello, Dr. Verma. How are I, you? I, I remember. I remember. Uh, you know, when you visited, uh, you know, India. I still have uh, fond memories of the photos. That. The photos photo, together. Photo also <laughs> I have. Photo yeah. also I have. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. It's to my pleasure. Yeah, we, it's our we pleasure are waiting to host to, you. We are waiting to host you in in, in Cairo. Yeah, uh, mark your calendar the 17th of May, and I will send you the 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 the, the logo and with the presentation the logo with the date just to keep the date. And in 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 two or three days, I will send you the names of the doctors who will be ascending the all India. And following, you can send me the names of the our colleagues in India, whether you personally, whether Dr. Prasad, Dr. Namrata, whatever the colleagues, five we, colleagues we, are we, welcome. Uh, no, uh, we, we in Cairo. Uh, 
No, no, yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Mm-hmm. Mahmood, we have a we have a committee which which goes into it, and we definitely love to have uh, you know MOUs with all uh, international bodies to to you know bolster relationships as well as some exchange programs also. Like currently, Perfect. we are having a uh, you know uh, with a lot of uh, SAR countries as well as with uh, Australia, New Zealand, we have uh, MOUs. We yes. have with Russia. So I can I see the logos to, of the old yeah, yeah. site. So I, yeah, I would yeah. be very happy to, you know, receive your invite and then we will discuss in our managing committee and get back uh, as early as possible. Yeah, but, perfect. Uh, but very nice to see all of you and uh, thank, thank you. you for participating in this program. And till the time we meet physically, I hope you enjoy this, uh, you know, uh, uh, virtual program, which has been so nicely designed perfect. by our Honorary Secretary, Dr. Namrata Sharma. Thank you, Dr. Namrata, for, uh, you for organizing this. And thank you, thank you all. Yeah. No, no, it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. Chal, thanks thank a lot. You, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Professor Namrata. Bye bye. Thank you, Dr. Prasad. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.
Hi, Eric. Hi, Rocky. How are you doing? Um, I just want to test one thing real quick, but by screen sharing, make sure I've got everything down, if you don't mind. Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Hey, is every, everything cycling through just one slide at a time? Yes. Perfect. Okay, great. Just wanted to make sure I had that right. And do we have an order that everyone's speaking in? Yes, I'll just give you that as well. Give me a second. Sure. I apologize for not having things into no, you. No worries, no worries. I ended up getting COVID this week, so oh I have been. God. How are you feeling yeah, now? I'm I'm doing okay. I'm not quite out of my quarantine period yet, okay. but I'll, I'll be out. Today's my last day, so okay. That'll be good. So your number is, uh, your sequence is second number, so. Okay. Okay. Great. Perfect. All right. I'm going to turn my camera off and mute my microphone then until it's time. Okay.
Hello, Dr. Sujata. How are you? Uh, fine. I am not able to start my video. Check your settings. Yeah, I start video. Zoom is unable to detect the camera. Make sure your camera is powered on and connected. Okay. okay, anyway, I could at least. <laughs> Hi, Eric. Sorry, I was on mute. Hi, how are you doing? I'm fine. You keep on traveling. Looks like. Um. Well, yeah, I was. Uh, I think. Yeah, I'd just gotten back from UAE when you sent me an email before. So yeah. Uh, next week. Uh, no, week after next, I'll be going to Germany for the European iBank Association meeting, and then on to Australia for their meeting. Okay. Raki, looks like the hall B is empty. The previous session is over. The previous session got over earlier, actually. Just now? Mm -hmm. At five o'clock only, only it was over. Okay. So we entered at 5.15 and it was empty. Okay. So... Hi, Dr. Rachna. This is Dr. Sujata Das. Hello, is uh, hello, Dr. Sujata. Yeah, I'm Dr. Rachna. Uh, good to hear you uh, from uh, all of you. Yeah, we used to meet Lena quite often. Uh, yeah, this time, yeah, I'm going to present on behalf of Dr. Lena, but she's not feeling well uh, this time. Okay. A request to all the speakers to please put out your camera while you are presenting. Ah, but I don't know. <laughs> I say that I have to switch and I'm trying in between if I can. I'll give my phone away. Dr. Swata, we'll wait for five minutes and then start, okay? Maybe okay. more people will join by then. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, good afternoon. Sir, good evening. <laughs> good evening. Good evening. Press, when press. you say good evening, then I consider I am in India. When you say good afternoon, I consider I am in Tashkand or Oman. And good night, it means somewhere in Thailand. Okay. <laughs> All times are good times. <laughs> I'm connected with two things because my video is not coming in my laptop. I don't know why. Are we planning to do like a Q&A session afterwards or am I free to jump off once I'm done with my presentation? Eric, I understand that you have a, like you have a very, very uh, odd timings there right now. So we, yeah. if we have questions for you, we will have it just after your presentation so that you can um, like leave the session after that. That's perfect. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Sorry, I downloaded my background, but it is a virtual background from yesterday late night. It's not showing something wrong.
so dr sujata we have our first three speakers with us i think no first four also uh, so if you permit we can start yeah i think we should start because it's already 5:30 so yeah, yeah i think we should go like start but they're not waiting for anybody else no yes so But anna is not here no anna i have sent her recording because she is also down with fever so i have the recording for her so i can play that okay but i think since eric is here uh, we yes. can take eric uh, right eric's first yes uh so, oh you want me to go first that's fine uh technical team uh, let us know when we will be live so that we start accordingly we are live okay. uh good evening all um thank you aws for the opportunity for i bank association of india to do participate in this international conclave uh before we start first talk i'll request professor and uh, major porya to give the first introductory talk then followed by eric stock sir yes uh, uh uh dr sujata we can proceed because there is uh, some problem with the connectivity and okay. uh, i must uh, acknowledge uh, aius for giving us this uh, platform it's a very uh, good uh, initiative from their side and uh, we have the solvers in our evi dr sujata and uh, dr navrata and the uh, rock behind uh, all of us is abhis uh, rakhi and i foresee that uh, this particular symposium on uh, i banking will be path breaking so far the if, uh, knowledge is spread on various aspects of i banking i welcome you all on this uh, specific occasion uh, please uh, proceed with the proceedings okay. now mr rakhi please take over yeah uh, so i would like to introduce mr e uh, eric helio Eric is the global development um, uh, officer at the Aosite USA, and he is going to present on the tissue supply and the global need. So over to you, Eric. Thank you very much. Let me just share my screen here to get my slideshow running. Okay. Well, thank you to EBAI for yet again allowing me to speak at this event. Um, I really do appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about the tissue supply and the global need. Uh, as as was mentioned, my name is Eric Kelly, and I'm the global development director at Eversight. Every presentation that I make, I like to begin with our mission statement to sort of remind everyone. Um, why we do what we do and i think everyone kind of has something that's similar to this eversight's mission statement is we restore sight and prevent blindness through the healing power of donation transplantation and research the beginning part of my presentations you'll notice there's a number of things that were similar slides to the last presentation that i gave for ebai and that's because we're really trying to drive home some of the points of these global needs and the the tissue scarcity that we're still undergoing in spite of the fact that covid is you know sort of quote unquote over but we want to talk to start with about the gift of sight and the public health priority and this is a a map of eversight tissue placement in areas that eversight has been involved in with tissue placement directly this is something that i've shown in several different presentations where you can see a number of the orange flags there that show where eversight does have impact there's also a whole lot of area that's blue where we really don't have an impact in or significant impact for one reason or another um we do have five different offices one in south korea and then four more throughout the united states So one of the things this is the EBAA statistical report and what you can see here is an upward trend right up until covid with not just the overall number of corneas that were provided for transplant from US recovered sources but an increase in the global portion of that so the portion that was sent outside of the United States for transplant right up until 2020 And then we see the sharp decline and a, a resurgence in 2021. Unfortunately, at the time of this presentation, the 2022 statistics were not available, so this is the most recent copy that we have. 
And basically what we're seeing here is there were just under 30,000 corneas per year pre-pandemic that were recovered in the U.S. and sent outside of the U U.S. Um, that number was cut in almost half in 2020 because of the COVID pandemic. And then in 2021, it did recoup significantly, but it's still quite a bit down. So what we're still seeing is somewhere around a four, four and a half percent decrease in the number of tissue that's being transplanted from U.S. donors to U.S. recipients. But that number outside of the U.S. is more like 19.27 percent. So this just goes to show, again, that U.S. tissue being provided to other sources is, is not really a long-term or effective solution. One of the main differences that, I, that we were, we've been working on over the last several months is trying to figure out really what is the global need. I mean, we, we see numbers that are thrown around all over the place. Uh, best estimates are between 10 and 12.7 million corneas needed. Um, you know, India has a reasonable analysis for gathering the true need there, but a lot of other countries do not. Um, we just, it's sort of guessing work. And to this point in time, even countries themselves, we would ask them, what is your, what is your corneal need? And many of them wouldn't have an answer. So one of the things that we were able to do is take a look at some, some data and try and analyze how can we determine what would be a best estimate in, in the absence, I should say, of actual data being collected. So in countries where data is collected reasonably, like in the United States, like in India, Italy, many European countries, this particular equation wouldn't necessarily hold true. But in the absence of true information, it's a pretty good estimate. And what we started off by doing was taking what the IAPB's vision loss percentage was and multiplying that by the population to get a raw number. And then the determination was that anywhere from two to 10% of that vision loss would need a cornea transplant. Now we can look at two areas and kind of see how this plays out. The Middle East, North Africa region, our estimates have told us that it was somewhere around a million corneas that were needed. And with a population of 621 million and an eight and a half percent vision loss and a two, per, two to 10 percent vision loss needing cornea transplants, you get between one and five million corneas needed. So what this is telling us is one, our information is probably not that far off. And two, if anything, it might be underreported. When we look at the Gulf Cooperative, um, we see a population of 59 million, about seven and a half percent vision loss in that area. So that translates to about 90,000 to 450,000 corneas needed. So what that's telling us is, is that in just the small area of the GCC, more than three times the need of what the U.S. was exporting at its best is required right now. And that number could be significantly higher. <coughs> So some of the things that are affecting tissue supply, uh, again, COVID, it's still, I know that it's sort of old news, but honestly, it's not done yet. We're still seeing tissue ruled out because of COVID risks. And there are a couple in, increases of barriers to entry in some areas that are still requiring COVID testing or COVID negative patients. Um, a lot of places, if there has been recent COVID testing, they do wanna see a negative result still. This is particularly interesting since all of the information we have still seems to suggest that COVID is non-transmissible through ocular tissue recipients from, from donors to recipients. So in spite of the fact that the risk is almost non-existent to the point that I don't believe we've actually seen a single case of ocular transmission, um, we're still all got there's still several governments that are very concerned about it, and we're still in asking the high risk questions. So, in addition to some of these things like pandemic, we are also seeing that average U.S. life expectancy increase, and there's a significant amount of life expectancy increase around a lot of areas that have that potentially could have a surplus of tissue or tissue beyond what their current local needs are. In the US, we've quantified this by showing that in 92, it was at about 75 and a half was the average life expectancy, which was just over what the high end for recovery was for age. And then that jumped to 79 and it's estimated to be almost 84 years old by 2052. So the, the interesting thing about that would be is that as of right now, the average life expectancy would be significantly higher than what our high end for cornea recovery would be. Now that's 
we are in the process of changing that as are several other I banks. So we're catching up sort of with the times and seeing that increasing the age criteria is a necessity. So the saddest part about all this is that the countries that need it the most are the ones that are finding the supply the most limited. Not just the ones that need it the most, but the ones that can afford it the least are also being affected by some of these increased fees. So we've seen shipping costs due to the pandemic and those aren't coming down anytime soon. In the United States, we have seen a ridiculous inflation situation hit as we've seen in several other countries throughout the rest of the world. There's equipment costs that are increased due to the shipping costs. There's just less tissue that's available and that's really affecting the lower, the, the countries that have less ability to reimburse at a higher rate. Um, when you look at things like just surgeon pickiness alone could increase the reimbursement rate of the U.S. cornea by up to 800 U.S. dollars. And in many instances, that's what more than what countries are paying. So it's more than doubling the price. So we talk about how do we fix some of this stuff? Well, there's no easy answer. And I mean, I don't think we can truly fix everything, but we can work towards making things better. Um, Unfortunately, all of these factors disproportionately affect the areas that need to be, that need the most help. So the areas that are most vulnerable have the lowest per capita GDP. They're the ones that get hit hardest and have already been hit hardest. So this is really what underlines the idea that we need to get effective eye banking systems, not just in one country or in surrounding countries, but everywhere that we possibly can. I've talked before about some of the challenges and opportunities, but seeing some of the cost structure for local to recover tissue is always going to be lower than the cost structure for getting tissue from a foreign country. And then supply chain shipping, all of that not being predictable is yet another situation that caused that lends to local development of eye banking to be the, the only truly sustainable and long-term impactful way. The nice thing we do have is that as we start to increase our campaigns, we've got social responsibility, community engagement, things of that in a generation now that we haven't seen in generations in the past. So really the only true time-tested, true measure is the local donor being the donor of tomorrow, this iBank development program being the way to truly have an opportunity to solve corneal blindness throughout the world. And even as we start to see different things like um, artificial cornea, the um, uh, stem cells, things of that nature that are able to increase the, the impact of one single donor, eye banking is always going to be needed. So anything that is started and made efficient, things that are made better with existing eye banks or created from different eye banks, it's all just going to lead to the future instead of being something that would be eliminated in the future. Eye banking will be around for a while in some form or another. So really what this comes down to is a call that we all need to work together, get these collaborations going, find as many partnerships as we can. Um, it's just too big of an opportunity to tackle by one person, one eye bank, one organization, no matter how big they are. So. Really the idea is, is that we need to find groups like EBAI, groups like GABA, US I banks that are willing to come together and say, how can we collaborate? How can we bring these resources together? And what can we do to try and make things incrementally better so that fewer people have to go without sight? Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I am free. To, I am happy to answer them. My email address, if you have anything in the future is right there. Thanks, Eric. Can I ask one question? Mm -hmm. uh, in 2022, uh, the collection is, is it back to pre COVID or is still? Less? No. No, we're still, the, the numbers are still, are still low. And one of the things that this has done is it's changed some of the criteria that a lot of surgeons have had. So where you know, some of the U.S. surgeons used to be really super picky about what they wanted. Um, they're not as picky anymore. So even some of the tissue that we had available after U.S. surgeons were had met their needs, it's a lower pool and the quality, the, 
perceived quality. I hate saying quality because there's a lot of science behind showing that uh, quality isn't necessarily what we think it is. So we are seeing just a, a significant shift in many, many ways. Um, where before we were trying to find opportunities to place the tissue, now we unfortunately can't fulfill all of the requests that we're getting, sadly. Yeah. Uh, so maybe one more question before we ask others. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is the average waiting time for a surgeon if they ask for it so Is it completely zero day or one day or sometime it takes a little bit more? Are you talking a U.S. surgeon or a surgeon yes, outside yes, of the U.S.? Yes, a U.S. Yes. surgeon. There's really not much of a wait in the U.S. even to this point. Um, we're still scheduling surgeries several you know, weeks out, months out. Really the only time that a U.S. surgeon runs into an issue with tissue is if they are being particularly picky about their, um, their tissue parameters. Uh, then it might be challenging to meet. So, you know, if a surgeon wants something that's, if they have a younger donor, a younger recipient, and they want, you know, a 35 or less with a 3000 cell count and death to surgery interval of four days with, you know, 12 hour death to preservation, that, that might take a week or two for us to come up with. We might have it, we might not, but, um, that's really the only time that U.S. surgeons are waiting that I'm aware of. Thanks a lot for presenting in okay. order. <laughs> yes. Shall we take the next speaker? Yeah, I think thank so. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank right. you, Eric. So our next speaker is Dr. Rachna Singh Rana. She is the deputy medical director for I ba Nepal Eye Bank and is a very reputed corneal surgeon at Telaganga Eye Institute, Nepal. She is going to talk about the potentiality of crematorium based corneal donation and its comparison with HCRP. So, over to you, Dr. Rachna. Uh, good ev uh, evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me this uh, golden opportunity to present uh, my topic uh, on AIOC. I thank you, whole EVAI team, for this. Yeah, can you see the my slides on the screen? Yes, Dr. Rachna. Yeah. Okay. So today I'm going to present on potentiality of the crematorium-based corneal donation and comparison with hospital-based corneal retrieval program. So I'm, uh, as we know that I'm working in Tilganga Institute of Ophthalmology as a cornea faculty for last uh, more than uh, uh, 10, 12 years. So uh, I like to uh, see, I like to focus on this geographic map of Nepal um, the, we know that uh, Nepal, my country, Nepal, is a landlocked country, which is in between the two big countries, India and China. So we uh, we have three uh, continents like Himalayan regions, hilly regions, and flat areas, also known as Tarai regions. So this is a uh, uh, our main uh, capital city of Nepal, Kathmandu, where the our Nepal Eye Bank is located. So regarding the burden of corneal blindness globally, currently the worldwide blind population is estimated to be 36 million and an additional 135 suffer from the moderate to severe vision impairment. Of these 253 million persons, 2.4% uh, are attributed to the corneal causes. According to the World Health Organization, blindness of the cornea is a fourth leading cause of blindness globally. And it is one of the major cause of visual impairment after cataract, glaucoma, and age-related macular degeneration. On the behalf of Nepal, we can see that we have big studies in, in 1981 and 2010. In 2010 uh, recent studies, we saw that 6% of blindness is due to cornea, due to corneal conditions and diseases. So regarding the history of Nepal Eye Bank, it was established in 1994 with two staffs. Uh, in first year, we have one eye donor 
in our iBank operations. In 1996, it is initiated by Temple Donation Counseling, which is also known as Temple Banking. In 1998, it is partnered with Lions Club and other social organizations from when our Temple I Banking program has been very much effective. In 2010, we established with our, our uh, Site Life uh, Partnership. With the help of Site Life Partnership, we launched our hospital-based cornea recovery program in Kathmandu, and which uh, we achieved our Site Life International Quality Certification in 2015. In 2022 and onwards, we are having 1,000 uh, plus transplant every year. So Cornea Collection Center in our Nepal Eye Bank is from two uh, places. One is chromatorium, which is 40.8%. The other one is hospital-based uh, corneal retrieval program, which is 59.2%. So crematorium, again, we have one electrical cremation and one is traditional uh, cremation. In hospital-based uh, corneal retrieval program, we have very big hospitals in our capital city uh, <clears throat> from where we are receiving uh, donor cornea. So the challenges in the beginning that we faced for. So the challenges were we don't have established eye banking system. There's no national eye banking strategy. We have to depend on the voluntary donation calls and we have very limited community awareness. So in that time, we have to import it cornea from other countries. In this bad diagram, you can see that from 1994, when the eye bank is established, we have three imported cornea from uh, other countries. And in 1995, it was 243. And 1996, it was 106 numbers. In 97, it was 95. And in 1998, when there is a collaboration of our iBanking with our local um, NGOs and uh, our Rotary Clubs, we are started having our own donor corneas from um, crematorium based and hospital based, then we have a very less number of uh, imported cornea from other countries. So we are fully depend on ourselves. I like to uh, define, so what is a crematory based corneal retrieval program? It is a process of obtaining ocular tissue in cremation environment by counseling the family members of the deceased and getting consent from the nearest relatives for retrieving corneas. It has been proved to be the best motivational approach in the context of current eye banking program in Nepal. So these are the different uh, pictures of uh, crematorium based and hospital based uh, cornea retrieval centers. Here in this picture, you can see that these two are the crematory best in which this is an electrical cremation and this is a traditional crema cremation, which is located in Kathmandu Valley. It's a near a Bagmati River, which, which we all uh, know that it's a holy river and it's uh, near to the Pashpatinath Temple. Uh, our um, hospital and our Nepal Eye Bank is uh, located in the premises of Tilganga Institute of Ophthalmology, um, uh, which is near to this Pospatinas Temple. So these four big hospitals are from the Kathmandu. So this is a big hospital, which is a very big, old and government hospital. This is Said Gangalal Hospital. This is Patan Hospital, and this is Teaching Hospital. Um, these four hospitals are very renowned and very famous hospital in the Kathmandu city, from where we are getting a very huge number of corneas nowadays. And we have also other um, hospital-based cornea retrieval program running in the periphery of our country also, but the number is quite less. So this, uh, this picture is um, uh, crematorium. So this is the natural cremation in our country, where you can see that this is also the bank of the river, um, um, Bagmati River in Pashmantinath Temple, where you can see that there is a cornea excision center at the side of the cremation. So this is the existing counseling room and excision room at crematorium. So we are continuing uh, to get the uh, to get the um, cornea donor cornea from the traditional and newly electro electrical crematorium with maintaining standard quality of the donor cornea excision. 
as we know that the Pashmatnath Temple, uh, we are getting so many corneas from the Pashmatnath Temple crematorium best. So this is one of the sadhus who live in Pashmatnath Temple uh, got benefited from the cornea transplantation. So what is the benefit of crematorium based uh, corneal retrieval program? So crematorium is a consistent source of potential eye donors. And we know that death is a universal truth. So in this, in this place, we can counsel the patient party uh, to motivate and encourage to uh, donate the corneas um, um, uh, <clears throat> for the benefit of the needy people. So I think the crematorium-based corneal retrieval program is quite effective in our country. So one of the study that we have done uh, to see the effectiveness of corneal retrieval program in tertiary hospital and major crematorium of Nepal, in which we can see that death to preservation time of tissue in both the uh, program is six hours, which is quite effective. And this is a bar diagram of uh, this. This is a table which showed uh, frequency of S group in cornea in crematorium based and hospital based cornea retrieval program. Here we can see that in crematorium based, we see the numbers uh, of donor corneas is high among the persons of age more than 40 till 65. I think this is the um, huge number is due to a chronic illness, uh, which is uh, which is um, we getting from the crematorium based corneal retrieval program. But in hospital based corneal retrieval program, we see the more numbers are in of younger age. Um, I think this is due to the road traffic accident that uh, that can um, um, that landed in the big hospitals of Kathmandu city. This is again the table showing uh, sources of donation and quality of the cornea donation. So here we can see that this Aregat Pashpati and Electric Crematorium. So in both of uh, these um, crematorium-based uh, centers, uh, get uh, we have um, getting good corneas. Sorry good optical qualities corneas and also from the, the different four different hospitals we are getting a good quality of cornea so this means there is not much difference in quality of cornea from either you got from a uh, uh, crematorium based or you uh, getting from a hospital based uh, corneal retrieval program so this is the table showing a mean of endothelial cell density of right eye from crematorium and hospital-based program. So here again, we can see that from all uh, crematorium and hospital, uh, hospital corneal retrieval program, we are seeing that the mean, mean uh, cell, uh, endothelial cell density is above 2000. So I think this is a good number for performing keratoplasty in our country and also the same for, for the left eye also. So conclude that there is no significant difference in the quality of donor cornea uh, retrieved from either crematorium based or hospital based uh, cornea retrieval program. Uh, thus uh, crematorium based cornea retrieval program could be recommended in other places also. So this is a picture of uh, one uh, one of the patient uh, of our um, hospital, and she, in the, in the first picture before uh, cornea transplant, she looks very worried and unhappy. And after the uh, successful cornea transplantation, she looks more, she looked more confident and happy. And uh, um, um, being a cornea surgeon, I'm very proud to say that we are uh, having a cornea transplantation more than 1,000 per year in our country. In this picture, we can see that these four siblings of the same Muslim community are um, are suffering from a uh, congenital hereditary congenital dystrophy. So we can, from this, we can say that we have a lot of corneal bar, um, burden in our country. So we need more corneas to read uh, to get rid of these conditions. So I like to suggest and recommend to run crematorium based corneal retrieval program. So we have to find a main uh, cremation site along with the graves facilities where there is uh, relatives nearby the eye bank. And we have to approach and coordinate with trustees and get MAU done. And we have to organize meetings and sensitize with cremators and concern towards importance of corneal donation. 
We have to coordinate with local social NGOs like Lions Club, Rotary Club to initiate these type of programs. We have to create appropriate environment in crematorium based corneal retrieval program for the counseling and exigent room for the cornea donation. We have to place a senior EDC or technician for to perform this um, cornea donation program to uh, perform cornea accident in a safety and uh, safety manner. So this is a quality certificate uh, that we got from Site Life um, um, in two thousand in um, first April two thousand twenty one, and it uh, it is validated till thirty first March two thousand twenty three. So uh, different articles has been published for Temple Eye Banking in Nepal in previous days. So far, by concluding the my presentation. I'd like to thank you all for listening to us. And for uh, before saying that, I'd like to say that in our, uh, in our country, we have a lot of corneal diseases um, um, in our country. And I'd like to serve uh, all the needy people by uh, collecting more and more corneas through crematorium-based and hospital-based corneal retrieval program. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Dr. Vachna. Uh, uh, it is a unique mode of cornea collection in Nepal, and it is very successful, as we know. So I hope you will be there till the end. Uh, yeah. If there's yeah. any questions, we can. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you so much. Uh, since uh, Dr. Namrata Sarma is here, and uh, Namrata, will you please speak a few words? Because Namrata has to, might, might have to go to some other halls. And all of us know she wears different hats at different times. So she might go to AOS, uh, other, uh, because we have parallelly so many uh, halls are running. Namrata? Dr. Swata, we will ask her if, uh, if she's not available right now. OK. Uh, and we'll go to the next speaker. So uh, I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Swata Das. She is the secretary for iBank Association of India. And she's a faculty member at the LV Prasad I Institute, Bhuvneshwar, since 2006. She was the director of the institute from, uh, from 2017 till 2017. And now she's also the medical director of the Drishtidan I Bank since 2007. She's going to talk about the I banking in India, past, present, and future. Um, over to you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Sujata. Thank you for organizing this. Thank you for organizing this, Sujata and uh, Rakhi both. Thank you for organizing this EBI session. Okay. I, I, I think you are busy and I'm not no, able, to, I'm able to switch. And yeah. Very late night, I did the all those um, screen saver, everything, but I'm not able to switch. And the oh, video. doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay. So I'll be speaking up. Uh, in eye banking in India. So, uh, uh, as all of us uh, know, that eye bank in in, uh, in world it was started in 1944 in New York. So immediately after one year in India it was started. So, and starting we just after immediately after one year after US and Dr. Danda and Dr. Kaleva from first cornea transplantation and most of us must be familiar with this. Uh, this uh, graph which shows the corneal blindness. In this, India comes under almost sufficient category. If you see the uh, this picture, this picture is somehow I feel is not bad. If we see the size of the one is uh, readiness. The, so India is ready to combat the blindness. Although the load is definitely high, but at the same time, we are ready to combat this blindness. So in India, most of the places, this works like this. We have IBAN and I donation center and IBAN training center where only IBAN people are trained like technician and counselors. The model was proposed long back, that one IBAN for every 20 million people and each IBAN can be connected to 40 I donation center where the, just the harvesting, harvesting of cornea is done. And in iBank, the rest of the serology and processing is done. So each iBank can be connected to HCRP, provided there are 10 major hospitals, but at least the iBank can process this content. 
and the calculation that time was 50% through HCRP and 50% through eye donation centers. It may not work in all places because India is a huge country. Some places the voluntary is high. This is the hospital corneal retrieval program is high. We all know this HCRP is a successful model, but there are places in second tier, third tier places where the HCRP is not possible. And in contrast, the voluntary is 70%. So it varies from different place to different place. Again, the calculation is long back. I like Eric. It's a presentation when you told you might have to do the calculation or repeat survey to know whether there is really the need or it is more or it is less. So this is long back, around 20 years back. The calculation says that we need 100,000 corneal transplantation. Keeping that mind that 50% is the utilization rate, it is slightly higher nowadays to 200,000. So each eye bank with adequate structures, 4,000. For India, the calculation was we need 50 eye banks. So this is the EBI data which shows that we need 200,000, but we have highest, highest collection is 57,000, which is 2017-18. And all of us know the reason of the DPA, 2020. We have gone up, but still it is yet to come to the pre-COVID level. So see the utilization, utilization is more than, definitely more than 50% and a type of surgery, if you see from the zone wise, uh, most of the time the south zone and east zone is list. In India, the, for the eye banking, it is divided into five zones. So every, like optical PK, therapeutic PK, all the ahead, south zone is ahead. And a north zone comes after that, followed by east and east, or central, east and central are almost same. So again, the growth in not, uh, you can see the collection also in tower is highest in south zone. So it depends on the awareness also. Similarly, the utilization is expected because the collection is high. So utilization also is south zone is highest. So I think if you see the number of eye bank has gone up in comparison to collection, the com it was in 2010, 469, almost 300, it is not double, but it is two third increase, 70% growth in plus a bank bank. So these are the cornea uh, collection eye bank. So we have uh, 2020 and 2021. More than 1,000 collection at the few eye banks because of the COVID. But if you see the 1920, there are many eye banks which collects more than 1,000. So we did a uh, survey during lockdown. So what is the waiting period? Because the, it always shows that we need to collect more and there are a lot of waiting. Surprising that not many before pre-COVID area, this waiting time is very less. If you see the hardly 92, 180 days, surgeons say that 1.6% people wait for three months. It is mostly less than 90 days. All these people are I bank or surgeon wait for this. So this may not be correct data because many surgeons are in metros. There are places which is not accessible. There are no county surgeon. But the county surgeons who are operating, the waiting period is less. However, with the COVID, the waiting period might have because this is during lockdown. So I bank. India has a uh, lot of SIP, uh, like it is all over in uh, world in world that this has changed. More emphasis now on utilization rather than collection. And uh, many people have shifted. I know many people have shifted to intermediate cornea surgery for collection, not only for the, mostly we collect uh, that with MK. If it is uh, requires to transport some places, we change to intermediate, but there are places I know where they collect an intermediate cornea storage solution rather than changing. So, of course, you need a proper screening for that. And many iBank, it was it was thought that iBank are always charity model. Uh, now the thought process has changed that it needs to be self-sustainable because we know many iBank closed down because of charity model. And uh, in India, many, are like, not like US, all the iBank do, but many iBanks have started doing pre-cut tissue and started sending throughout the country. Even DMEC role also has started um, done by a technician. Many also has gone to uh, technical slit eval lab evaluation by technician rather than waiting for the cornea surgeon. 
So way forward for us is uh, because we, I saw the graphs where the uh, southern states are ahead of other states. So we will plan for other states' eye banking activity. Uh, the more training center for the training of counselor as well as technician. Uh, as a cornea surgeon, we know many cornea graph fail because of the lack of proper management. Either they cannot travel. So the training for general ophthalmologist is required to maintain the cornea transplant. More trained cornea surgeon. So more lamella, although we know the infection is a major cause of cornea transplant in India, uh, but still many surgeons are transplanting to uh, lamella surgery. We need to have uh, epidemiological information about cornea blindness and cornea graft registry. Uh, like um, uh, many people in Australia, Europe, they have a graft registry to see how the graft maintained after the surgery. And accreditation currently done by SightLife and EBAI are for PUI bank. Maybe in future, we can plan to do most of the eye bank uh, for the, uh, to maintain the quality. And EBI is always for advocacy and policy. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Sajata. I have a question for you. Uh, yes. During the COVID period, we saw a surge in the utilization rate, of course, because there was a lack of the tissues. So people were using therapeutic, tectonic, all kind of tissues. So some eye banks were as high as 90% utilization rate as well. So in your experience, has the utilization rate after the COVID gone down to the average or at your eye bank because you um, distributed most of the tissues in the country, like the, being the largest eye bank. So what are the, how are the utilization rate at your eye bank currently? Uh, see, this, uh, I'll, first I'll tell about Drishtidan eye bank where we have all, always a high, a very uh, High utilization is around 80% in Andhra Nai Bank. Uh, because one is the major uh, tea of collection is from hospital corneal retrieval program, almost 95%. So there is not a huge difference between uh, during COVID and uh, uh, post COVID, pre COVID. Mm -hmm. Across the network of LVP, uh, the utilization was definitely more during that time. Partly, I'll say, because the screening was proper. And there is not uh, much of tissue to choose. I'll not use this because therapeutic is always a demand. I think that those are the region for highest utilization. Uh, it is not uh, gone back across the network. Also, we have around 70% utilization. Uh, in Drishtidan, it is highest. Uh, I think it's still the utilization same. It is not gone back to post-COVID. Okay. I think it's that's, that's a good news. Yeah. <laughs> that because... I see that in the in the northern part of the country, our eye banks are facing uh, issues in placing the therapeutic and tectonic tissues. So, so utilization is back to seventy five percent at most of the eye banks. So that's the question. That was the reason of the, for that question. So, um, shall we move to the next speaker now, and we'll take questions after the the talks then. So our next speaker is Dr. Arvind Roy. Uh, he's a consultant ophthalmologist with a speci specialist in cornea and anterior segment, cataract, laser, and refractive surgery, comprehensive ophthalmology at LV Prasad Eye Institute, Vijayawada. He's going to talk about role of middle income nations to support low income nations. So I'll share his presentation. Is the screen visible? Uh, you have to, I can see the screen, but not the presentation. Uh, now? Uh, no, not yet. One I can second. see. Um, it says that my screen is paused. Just give me a second. Is it visible now? Yes. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, wishing you all. Can you hear the voice as well? Yes, yes. Okay. Have a very good day. I am Aravind Roy. I'm a cornea faculty at LV Prasad Eye Institute, Vijayawada. I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest. I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to share our experience on this forum. Today, we shall be discussing the role of middle-income nations to support 
low income nations in developing i banking infrastructure corneal blindness is the fourth leading cause of global blindness and corneal blindness typically exists in those developing nations where resources are the least it typically affects the younger population thereby it has a huge socio economic burden corneal transplantation is central to reduce the burden of corneal blindness and corneal transplantation itself is dependent upon the eye banking structure in the community or the country if we take a look at this table we see that the countries such as ethiopia in sub saharan africa or indonesia in southeast asia have much lower levels of annual corneal transplantation as compared to the united states for example or india and even in countries like brazil where the numbers are high they may be very much skewed around urban areas like sao paulo india if we look at as a case study in i banking has doubled its corneal collection in the periods of 2003 to 2 to 2012 tripled its corneal utilization rate and the rate has improved by 46.3% we have made significant strides in i banking by developing our infrastructure improving our training and it is time that we look towards our neighbors and help them emulate our model and thereby help in the fight in reducing corneal blindness globally if we look at the global demographics of corneal blindness we see that most of the cornea blind live in india southeast asia and sub saharan africa and the challenges are twofold this is either a administrative or a technical challenge and it's important to introduce interventions at all of these levels i would like to share our experience with colleagues at myanmar where we collaborated with the university of sydney and cornea surgeons in mandalay and yangon as a concerted global effort where different international ngos elvi prasada institute university of sydney we helped to first understand what are the causes of decreased availability of corneas reduced corneal transplantation we again found as we had displayed in the previous slide very key administrative and technical points which were the road blocks to developing a good and robust i banking infrastructure and as a result of sustainable efforts over a period of year we can see that from 2011 to 2016 there was a incremental but definitive improvement in the number of corneas that were collected by our colleagues in myanmar and there was a significant increase in utilization of these corneas as well we interacted with the surgeons with key public figures we helped in procuring and installing equipment training the i bank personnel and also interacting with surgeons online using the eco platform for sharing experiences of managing difficult and challenging cases the key to the future lies in collaboration and for that we need to join hands with several like minded ngos world over the service delivery areas are typically where we can intervene and make a difference is sub saharan africa is one region that we can immediately help colleagues and amongst that where some of the areas that we have trainees are those situated in monrovia in liberia where elvi prasad i institute is committed to developing international capacity building our trainees are across the nation and also the region all in all mentoring trained i bank teams nurturing sustainable i bank practices liaisoning with the government and creating public awareness and hcrt are important steps and therefore continued surgeon training appropriate selection of cases improved patient compliance all leads to better outcomes of keratoplasty and developing more sustainable i banking practices and thereby helping in the fight 
of reducing the burden of global corneal blindness. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Hello, everybody, and wishing you all a very good day. Rati, can we go to the next? Arvind joins. Dr. Zaka, any comment from your side? I will see if Arvind joins, because Arvind is not here. If he joins, then we'll... Dr. Swata, any comment from your end? Um, yeah, I think we are at this state uh, now that we can train people uh, because sending uh, sending tissue is still not possible because we have a waiting list. But at least we can help uh, other countries where the I bank they are starting um, because we have thirty years experience. Uh, in building I bank and EBI also is equally 30 years old. I think uh, that's a very good point, Dr. Dasan. I think one of the things which um, we as a nation can help other nations is, is in the policy making. Because my experience with Ethiopia and the other countries was that they don't have any policy, no legal framework as well. So if that is something we can work on uh, providing a guideline to the other low-income countries that would be definitely helpful from them from the starting having a legal fr framework definitely helps actually rather than policy i'll say training india can do policy mm -hmm. so what the local because right. i also went to cambodia i went to cambodia for start mm -hmm. you know the law there says that uh, you can't do like i think the law says you can't take from dead person or something like that oh, okay so, uh, so uh, basically, the uh, changing policy might be, you need a local help, but training people or quality, all those can be trained. Definitely, I think training is something which definitely EBI as a uh, organization can also think about, like how can we train other people as well. So I think as a secretary, you can take this agenda forward. So you, <laughs> I'll write one more agenda. <laughs> so, so. So, shall we move to the next speaker now? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, the next speaker is Dr. Anna Sals. Dr. Anna is a research development and quality manager at DGFG Hanover uh, at Germany. She manages international project management and coordination of research activities, uh, support the establishment of new technological methods to improve tissue preparations, scientific publications and presentations at international conferences. She is also the member of European iBank Association. Uh, she's going to talk about the amniotic membrane transplantation without trauma, amnioclip plus. Looks like a very interesting topic for every one of us. So I'll just uh, put the record, the video on now. Let me know when the screen is visible. Yes. Dear ladies and gentlemen, my name is Anna Zais and I'm happy to participate. Uh, I keep we can hear, but we can't see. So if to maybe one All second. You can see? In person today. No, the, let, let, me, let me again share it once. I would like to present about an amniotic. Yes. Transplant. Volume, little bit more. That is uh, That's the max I can go actually. Dear ladies and gentlemen, my name is Anna Zaka. I represent the German Society for Tissue Transplantation, which is an independent and non profit organization. We support and manage tissue donation nationwide and 24 7. We provide professional support for tissue processing in the tissue banks of our network. We organize the distribution of tissue transplants and we support research and public relation activities for a better patient care and also to increase the awareness for tissue donation. Dear 
The human amniotic membrane is the inner layer of the placenta facing the fetus during a pregnancy. And the membrane can be procured as part of a living donation after a cesarean section. On the right hand side, you see the structure of the membrane, which consists of an avascular stroma site and then of a relatively thick basal membrane and a monolayer epithelium that is facing the fetus. The amniotic membrane contains numerous growth factors and it has um, a special role in wound healing due to its positive characteristics because it is anti-inflammatory but also has properties that are anti-angiogenic um, and inhibit vascular growth but also act antifibrotic and avoid scarring. The use of amniotic membrane for transplantation on the ocular surface was first described by de Rude in 1940. And today it is used for uh, treatment of ocular surface reconstruction after burns or chemical burns, but also in cases of chronic ulcer or perforating trauma, as well as in cases of high risk keratoplasties for limbus stem cell deficiencies. However, amniotic membrane transplantation has limitations because the membrane is sutured on the ocular surface and this creates an additional suture associated trauma because you are manipulating an already irritated tissue. This way also the treatment is not easy to repeat. And that is why we thought we need to have an alternative solution and we developed the so-called AmnioClip Plus that you can see on the left-hand side. And this is an option to apply the human amniotic membrane like a contact lens and thus avoiding additional surgical trauma. This AmnioClip Plus is very easy to apply. It is minimally invasive and it can be used in an outpatient mode. It causes only minimal irritation and only a local anesthesia is needed during the moment of application. As it, is, as it works like a contact lens, a repeated treatment is possible and still you have all the beneficial effects of the human amniotic membrane treatment. In general, the Amnioclip Plus is very well tolerated and I will come back to that point in a few minutes. The RC the amnioclip plus system consists of two different rings, which we call the amnioclip, and it is an inner steel ring and an outer silicon ring. And the moment the membrane is clamped into that system, this becomes the amnioclip plus. The amnioclip plus is prepared under clean wound conditions. To date, we have distributed to the surgeons around 400 AmnioClip Plus, and um, we wanted to know the feedback both by the surgeons, but also by the patients to see if that system works and if it is beneficial. And that's why we created surveys that you can see here and that were provided um, to the surgeons with the tissue to get their feedback. And so the feedback from the experts was that they used it mainly in the indications of ulcer, but also for epithelialization disorder after HSV infection, erosio or the dry eye syndrome. The duration of the disease um, was between one and 12 months before that treatment with the Amnioclip Plus was started. And 60% of the patients had received a conventional amniotic membrane transplantation before. The experts said that the insertion procedure is very easy in almost 100% and only complicated if there's very special anatomy of the eye, for example, if there's, if there's a keratoconus. The duration of the use of the RC Plus was predominantly 12 to 14 days. And um, the treatment response was overall very positive because more than 70% said that, a, that there's a health improvement and disease reduction received by the AmnioClip Plus treatment. 
Complications during the treatment were hardly reported. Um, more than 70% said there was no complication. And again, only if there's a deviating anatomy of the eye or an extreme sensitivity of the patient to pain. All over, the pain reduction was reported by 50% of the experts. The feedback from the patients was overall positive. Concerning the insertion procedure, more than 70% reported it as easy and painless, and occasionally they experienced it as unpleasant. And only again, if there is a very uncommon anatomy of the eye, it was perceived as complicated. Concerning the question of if there was a foreign body sensation, more than half of the patients said none. And if there was, then usually it lasted only the first um, one, two or three days and only very moderately. Pain due to the amnioclip plus was um, mostly reported as no, that there was no pain. And concerning the stability of the amnioclip plus, there was <clears throat> rare events of uh, loss or dislocation of the amnioclip plus. And if that happened, it was again in those cases of a deviating anatomy of the eye. In individual cases, the amniotic membrane can dissolve um, before the end of the intended treatment period. Overall, the personal evaluation of the benefit of the amnioclip plus treatment was regarded as helpful in 68% of the cases and only a few cases reported a discomfort in connection with that application. And with this, I would like to summarize that the amniotic membrane transplantation is a well-established method in the ophthalmology. And the amnioclip plus prevents a suture associated trauma. The amnioclip plus is manufactured under controlled clean room conditions, and it is successfully applied to patients. In our perspective, this innovation enables an optimized patient care. I would like to note that innovations like this is easier to realize in a network as we have it due to cooperation between the various specialists that are possible. I would like to thank the DGFG team and especially you for your attention. Dr. Das, do you have any comments on regarding yeah. the uh, This is like, uh, I don't, I mean, like we use a, uh, like suture or glue, but the only difference is like it is available. I did not see any. Uh, available that US uh, they already available Kera Pro. Mm -hmm. now, Dr. Ratsna, can you have any opinion on this? Even I have seen people use IV tube and without suturing, it is done in ICU. So I don't think anything uh, new. Dr. Ratsna, any comments from you? Ganesh, would you like to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to know if there will be any difference in the cost. Uh, I mean, uh, yes, expensive, definitely. Okay. Uh, because in the US, whatever is available is very... Yeah, we, I think that's definitely... Advantage is uh, easier. Uh, like, you don't have to suture or you can do in... Uh, so it will is I think more more or less is saving the time and yes yes the time of the surgery. Thank yeah. then uh, like those people you like you don't have to take under general anesthesia mm -hmm. if you can do under ICU don't have to come to the OR all those okay, okay. so that can be a uh, not requiring a major OT procedure kind of thing yes yes it can be done in OPD but this is this will be expensive. Okay. MG itself, those who don't prepare themselves, MG is expensive. After that, if you do all those, it will be expensive. Mm -hmm. so let's, but in a special uh, situation, if you see patient cannot be taken under general anesthesia, definitely it is huge. 
So let's move to the next talk um, by Mr. Anurag Taneja. He's the director of the Global iBank Development at SiteLife India. And he is going to talk about the lessons learned from iBanking in Asia. Second. Give me a second. Is the screen visible? Uh, yet to the, the three thing is coming. Let me know if it's visible now. Okay, one second. It says it's paused. Give me a second. Technology glitches. Mm -hmm. Is it visible now? Uh, yeah, it, it'll come, looks like. Yes. Okay. Is it audible? Uh, this is Anurag Taneja, Director of Global Lab and Development for Site Life. And today uh, I would like to present the lesson. Is it audible, Dr. Sujata? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, this is audible. I'm sorry I could not be present in person, but I would like to thank AIOS and EBI for this opportunity. So before we go into the learning, I just want to talk about site life strategy. So over the years, uh, we have taken a global health system approach to fix the critical needs uh, within the countries that we work with. And there are four pillars to our strategy. It's policy and advocacy, prevention and awareness, clinical training, and of course, iBand development. And with that, we move to the learnings. So the first thing I want to talk about is the focus on policy advocacy. We have seen that this is a, a long drawn thing, but it pays many fold. Uh, we divide the issues that we work upon into three categories. The first is access to donors, which has issues like uh, adoration law, wherever applicable, mandatory death notification, access to emergency cases, and so on. Uh, then, of course, there's the quality part. So, you know, regular updation of national quality standards and accreditation comes in here. And then there's access to care, which is where prevention is there, uh, where an equitable distribution of corneas and import and export wherever relevant, maybe not so much in India. And we have published uh, a policy guide, which is available on our website, and anyone can download that. I want to talk about uh, our banking community. So success uh, in our banking requires a thriving community. And a community like EBI has made a big difference to our banking in India. We saw how the community came together to save our banking during the pandemic, starting with guidelines, which of course led to recovery. So we saw this rapid recovery, as you can see in the graph. Um, key talent was retained. Um, there was effective adoption of uh, rapidly changing guidelines, which happened every two months. Uh, the 2020 standards came out and there was rapid policy advancement quite clearly done by the increasing processing fee uh, when the COVID-19 related expenses got up. So that is a big, big victory for the iBanking community within there. You know, this is something we have seen really changes, really makes a huge difference. Now, ICRP is something, I don't think there's a doubt in anyone's mind that this is the gold standard for cornea collection. Uh, over the years, we have learned um, there's years and years of data from pretty much all over the world, but also from Asia and India that HCRP works. Um, it's expensive, it's uh, difficult to do, but it's definitely worth the effort. And we've seen that happening. We've seen that the and HCRP as the percentage of total transplant has gone up from about 40% to nearly 75% now. The productivity of ordination counselors, which used to be something like a five um, per month, is uh, actually in 2021, it up to 14, which is a uh, almost a threefold change. So HCRP works. What needs to happen is that policy changes need to make the process painless and inexpensive for our banks. Uh, the community needs to come together to advocate for such policy changes, and that is how HCRP will become easy and accessible to all our banks and not just a fair few. Then uh, again, Evidence across industries, including healthcare and eye banking, has shown that investment in quality systems and certification and audits is critical for long-term success. Uh, we started this program back in 2013. The first uh, uh, certification actually happened in 2014. It's a, about a two-year process of quality consulting, and then the certification is between one to two years. 
And then, of course, there's continuous improvement that happens with an audit every two years. Uh, the big difference that we have seen is in efficiencies. Um, even though it takes effort, but you've seen utilization rates. India used to have it about 44%, but our partners are well over 70% when it comes to it. And that is comparable to anywhere in the world, whether it's United States, the Western world. These are the utilization rates that you see across the board. And it's only an investment in quality systems that has made it possible for these eye banks to perform at such levels. So it's critical, it remains important. It's difficult, but again, it's an investment worth making. Everything I talked about till now is not going to work if there's no training and development of employees. Uh, we can have the best employees if we don't train them, if we don't continuously develop them, they won't be able to follow quality practices. They won't be able to take advantage of everything that comes from policy changes if there's not continuous development. And uh, we have been quite the pioneers in this space. We have trained uh, over 1,200 eye bankers, about an equal number in physical sessions and in virtual sessions and continue to do so. Over the years, we have also developed a curricula for uh, the major eye banking goals, which is recovery, adonation counseling, tissue evaluation, and tissue processing. We completed the second version of this curricula last year, and we have made them available to our partner eye banks. Uh, especially the ones who are already uh, training centers. So there is development of training capacity in our partner eye banks. And I can safely say now that Indian eye banking is self-sufficient in training and development. In fact, uh, beyond what SiteLife has done, a lot of the partner eye banks are already innovating. There are new methods of training. There's excellent utilization of the virtual mode, which is really improving eye bank training in India for the better too. So much so that India is now becoming a hub for training of eye banks from other countries. We are already seeing that. That is going to improve, that is going to work better over the years. Then um, a lot of us know what CDS is. Um, now several eye banks uh, stop growing because they don't need any more corneas. There's only so much demand in their own institutions or their own city or state. A central distribution system makes those surplus corneas available to anyone in the country. Now, surgeons are not going to be necessarily in the same places where these eye banks are. And at the same time, eye banks in the vicinity of a lot of the high volume surgeons usually may not progress to the levels that they need to go. And especially it's true for a lot of surgeons who have uh, single practices. So how CDS works is that uh, surplus corneas from eye banks who are quality certified and are part of the system are made available to a centralized system. And surgeons who are part of the system they look for those or they basically talk about what their requirements are. There is a matching that happens at the central level, which is what is done by SiteLife and EBI. And these corneas get utilized. The success of the system is so much that last year, 16% of total transplants of all our partners, 21, were distributed through CDS. And we only have six partners who are actually part of CDS. So just six out of 21 partners were responsible and for 16% of total transplants. And these were only a part of their own total transplants. Mm -hmm. So the system has been so effective and so impactful. This is something we expect will continue or other organizations or the government are going to take up. Then everything I talked about is eye banking basics. We continuously look for innovative models. Uh, we've talked about a few of them like the, uh, the, the one I'm talking about right here, the spotlight on the crematorium cornea recovery program, there's the call center system as well. So the spotlight on CCRP, uh, Nepal has been running this for uh, decades now. Uh, they've been doing it quite well. Recently, they published a study, uh, which is in preprint right now, that they found no significant difference in cell density, uh, tissue grade on evaluation, even after just saying for D2P, donor age, and other factors between CCHCRP, CCRP and HCRP. So this is profound. There was no difference at all. And this is, I mean, though we talk about HCRP as the gold standard, uh, they have proven that the system works just as well if done properly. So there's no reason why our banks in India cannot take it up. And you know, this, along with other such models, are something which are the need of the hour. Our bank should really take them up. Then finally, a focus on financial sustainability, uh, something we've been talking about for many years. Uh, we've seen that you know, focus on sustainability is critical for long-term success. During COVID, uh, 
are banks that were financially sound were the ones that survived and have later been thriving. So our banks are financially fragile by design. And you know, wherever the leadership's focus has been on financial sustainability, they tend to perform better. They have better results, they are more engaged, uh, more stable teams, happier employees. It's it's not rocket science. It just needs a leadership commitment to focus on financial sustainability. And we've been talking about this for many, many years and will continue to do so. So to conclude, um, the future is bright. Uh, we need to work together as a community in progress. Uh, what we need to do is we need to share support with the other iBanks. iBanks who are doing well need to share support with the ones who are not. We need to focus on the implementation. We are landing our tissue processing fee to promote utilization instead of collections. Our banking system is mature enough. The policy accelerators to increase access to donors uh, such as mandatory debt notification and access to MLC cases should be taken up. And we need to embrace technology. Our banking is not going to be the same five years or 10 years from now. We really need to look ahead and embrace technology and be ready for that change. And that's it from my side. We'll be happy to answer any questions if there are. Or you can reach out to me on this uh, phone number and my email address is also there. Thank you so much. So all the talks are over now. So we may come to the questions to the panel and to the speakers. So uh, Mrs. Uma, um, I have a question for you. Are you there, ma'am? Umaji. Yeah. Umaji, you are Hello. Hello, Umaji, are you listening Hello. Hello, yeah. Yes. So, Umaji, um, before, I know that your iBank is doing a lot of awareness programs in Indore and outside Indore as well. So, what do you think because of these awareness programs, your voluntary collection and HCRP pe koi impact hua hai, the direct impact of the awareness programs. <coughs> awareness programs are definitely uh, I donation acha aane laga hai, voluntary aane laga hai aur chuke HCRP in daur mein bahut kam chalta hai nahi ke barabar HCRP yaha start hi nahi ho paya hai so I bank mein voluntary and motivatory call hi aate hai so that's a great thing, uh, Umaji, that without HCRP also, you are one of the largest iBank in the country. And I think your team needs a lot of applause for that. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Rachna, uh, are you there, ma'am? Yes, Raki. Yes. I, so fortunately, I have been the part of the Nepal's journey from HCRP in 2011-12 yeah. to until now, and it's heartening to know all the progress which you have done in HCRP in the crematorium program as well. As I'm aware that you also have started a lot of centers around Kathmandu as well in different places, if I'm not wrong, in Birat Nagar and other places. Are yeah, you yeah. also planning to have the crematorium programs there or you have already started something like that there as well? Or no, actually, hospital-based uh, coronary tribal program has been... Uh, based on different uh, parts of the country. As you said that it's a Biyat Nagar Lahan in Hechona also. But uh, till date, we have not started crematory best because as we know that the crematory best is far from the hospital. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's easier, you know, it's easier if the hospital is near to the crematorium uh, for to receive the donor cornea. So we have not planned yet, but the other numbers uh, regarding the hospital best, we are getting from the other parts of the country, but the, but the number is quite less in regards to the Kathmandu Valley. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Sujata, do you have any questions for Dr. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I just was thinking that rheumatrium based um, cornea retrieval, is the death to uh, uh, retrieval time it must be longer? No, actually, the, the study that I have showed you, 
uh, to address to preservation time in both crematorium and the hospital based it not not much longer so it's about the mean is 6.68 hours which is uh, quite good for a cornea donor so it's not quite long because as we are lucky to have a hospital which is near to the Pashpati Nath temple from where we are getting crematorium based uh, cornea, uh, donor cornea. So uh, the, uh, uh, the time is not much long. It's quite uh, good for the, uh, uh, for the quality of the donor cornea. But despite that, you have HCRP still more than uh, crematorium or voluntary. I had an uh, impression that uh, you have a lot of voluntary and crematorium, uh, but yeah, the yeah. proportion of HCRP is still bigger than this two. Yeah, yeah. The proportion of hospital SCRP is bigger than crematorium because we have, uh, as I may mentioned in my slides, like we have four uh, big hospitals of capital city in which we are getting uh, the uh, the corneal retrieval program is quite effective. So counselors are always uh, there for counseling and for encouraging the patients. So uh, SCRP uh, numbers are uh, quite uh, high in one of the big hospital, which is called teaching hospital. So um, um, in uh, compared to the crematorium based. Actually, Dr. Surata, with my experience, I know that some of the deaths which were supposed to come to the crematorium actually get counseled at the hospital itself. So yeah. So, and some of the deaths which we like there are left at the HCRP, they are counseled at the crematorium. So, I think that's a very good combination of both the programs together. And Nepal I Bank is one of the biggest examples of one country, one I Bank. I think the kind of unity you have in that sense is fantastic. Yeah. In actually, uh, uh, in Odisha, we started a hospital based uh, corner retrieval, not hospital, yeah, not hospital, I'll say, eye collection center in Puri, uh, uh, Puri Jagannath Dham for uh, uh, Dr. Rachna. So many people do uh, take to Puri for the last rites around Puri, at least people come from various places for the cremation to Puri. But we uh, like, unfortunately, we are not getting many from there. We thought because many are coming from different places for the cremation, but it is not so successful yet. I think, Dr. Rachna, if I am not wrong, in Nepal, you have an hospice concept. So even before the death, the person reaches yeah. near the crematorium. So yeah, Dr. yeah. Sata, they have this hospice concept when the person is about to like leave this yeah. world. They yeah. actually take the person near the crematorium, which is a hospice. Yeah. And yeah. the person dies near the crematorium. So that is why the death to preservation time is very low. And the counselors actually can go mm -hmm. and counsel the family as soon as the death happens. Uh, yes, Raki, as you have mentioned, it's a hospice type of thing. So whenever the patient is having a chronic illness and is about to death, then uh, then we are start again starting having counseling to the nearby relatives. And uh, we uh, previously took consent from their side also. And then so the time of preservation uh, is less in uh, crematorium based. Okay, Satish. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Rachna. Uh, Satish, are you there? Thank you. I think Satish, are you are if you are talking, you are on mute. Dr. Swata, do you have any more questions, Ganesh? Anyone? We have five more minutes to go before we end the session. I think um, uh, overall, I think. Uh, we are done and no questions. Uma, madam, any, any comments or anything? Madam, I could. Hello. Yes, madam. Hello. Hello. Yes, Uma, yes, yes. Sorry, okay. एक क्रीमेटोरियम का जो बात किया था तो वो उसका परमिशन कैसे मिल सकता है और वहाँ पे जो मतलब हमारा डेथ के बाद में आइडेंटिफिकेशन का टाइमिंग वो सब मैच करना 
इट इज अ वेरी डिफिकल्ट तो इसका क्या कोई परमिशन लेटर है या कोई परमिशन कैसे मिल सकता है इसका सो uh, ओमा so, जी uh, नेपाल में क्या है कि पशुपतिनाथ टेम्पल में बहुत सालों से लाइक फॉर मल्टीपल इयर्स दे आर डूइंग इट एंड सो वहां पे तो दे हैव लाइक स्टैब्लिश इट वेरी वेरी बिफोर लाइक इवन बिफोर दे स्टार्टेड एच सी आर पी दे डूइंग दिस सी सी आर पी देर आई थिंक इन आर इन इंडिया केस इट विल बी अ बिट डिफिकल्ट टू गेट द सिमिलर क्वालिटी ऑफ द टिश्यूज बिकॉज ऑफ द डेथ टू प्रिजर्वेशन टाइम आई नो दैट दे आर फ्यू आई बैंक्स who on and off go and do the recoveries at the crematorium ground like from the hospital when the body moves to the house and then after these all the rituals at the house then the body moves to the crematorium but exactly. that yeah but that's more like one of cases um once once in like two months or three months kind of situation uh but if we can find find out that there are some crematory some crematories where we can actually access the death at the right time um so we can try that but uh, if uh, but nepal model is a very established model like like our hcrp is model this ccrp is a very established model there so maybe we can take some points success points from there and then we can try at some places to see whether it will work or not i know that in in delhi there is a very big crematorium where they have tried it they do it again on and off but not on the regular basis in jaipur they have done a lot of awareness activities near the crematorium so like writing the awareness slogans on the walls of the crematorium sometimes after the family reaches there they do call the i bank for the for the i donation so that can be one area which we uh, can have uh, can still explore to increase the numbers of the i donation okay fine thank you so you have a permanent counselors at the crematorium dr rachna oh, i think select yes yes dr sada they do have a permanent counselor hey, dr rachna is back yes. i was answering the question yes. so uh, yeah so yeah but as i have already mentioned is uh, we uh, nepal i bank has been established in 1994 and till 2012 that we collaborated with site life and we started hospital based right from 1990, 1984 to 2000 from 1994 to 2012 our this uh, crematorium based is quite effective for 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 this what uh, i have to uh, say that we have to uh, moe with the government and main the local parties like we have rotary rotary club and uh, there are different clubs that are quite uh, you know uh, quite um, um, uh, smart uh, enough so like there's a lions club there's a rotary clubs so we have to uh sit with them and then we have to have a uh, um, uh, we have to counsel them about, according this so this has been with all the local people and local uh, local clubs of our country that uh, this program has been started and it has been for the last uh, for the last 10 years i think this um, crematorium best is quite effective after um, yeah baby uh, only after this um, in 2012 we we have uh, started our hospital based program till then uh, the crematorium based is uh, was sufficient to uh, supply uh, donor cornea to the corneal surgeons thank you dr rachna thank you raki dr sujata if you uh, give the permission we can close the session yeah yeah so, so thank you everybody for the Talk especially Dr. Rajesh, who is there from the beginning, uh, was maybe of time zone and busy day today is Shivratri. So yeah, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for giving thanks, me. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Rakhi and Ganesh for helping for the program. Thank and you, ma'am. Madam Satyesh for participation. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a nice time. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. thank you the technical team we can close the session from for now
Happy. 